Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's really good to talk about robotics uh, and to the grains industry. Um, there's not much work in this space um, in terms of the implications of robotics, machine learning, and, and intelligence systems, but I'll talk a little bit about some of that activity in there. I've uh, broken up the presentation into the following four bits. Um, when the organizers asked me to kind of talk about robotics, it's also about the implications in, into the future about what robotics could do. So in the first bit, I'm going to talk about platforms, but moving away from just robotics itself and moving into operations. What does it mean to have autonomous operations or operations that happen on farm automatically, which might have robotics uh, in there? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about platforms that are small and responsive and, and the kind of clash or, or maybe, maybe the dichotomy between large platforms that are autonomous versus or smaller platforms and, and what the differences are between them and, and, and what we can see from there. I'll talk about a project that we've just recently kicked off over the last few months, which is looking at non-chemical weeding for the grains industry and, and what that has as an implication uh, in, in robotics and, what, and how it can be used. And finally, uh, there's a lot of focus on robotics itself, but when I put my research hat on, there's a lot of technologies that are going to have an impact on robotics, which then has an impact on how it gets used in certain applications, in, especially in agriculture. So I'll touch a little bit on, on, on those ones as well. So we'll just start with the, the concept of platforms to operations. I've, I've shown three examples there of work that I've done in my lab with, with my colleagues uh, in various forms across different industries in Australia. And, and the reason why I wanted to kind of touch on this was uh, what started off with platforms quickly merged into what happens with operations in general. So if you go to Port Brisbane, Port Sydney, Port Melbourne, you'll see complete autonomous operations of berths, straddle carriers moving around 24-7 autonomously moving containers around. We know about the story out in, in the Pilbara and, and the work that Rio Tinto are doing around autonomous operations. Recently, we did some work with Qantas around redoing the whole flight planning system and how that changes the whole uh, airport traffic management uh, system as well. And what you notice in all of these fields is the, the quest is around, OK, we know the robotics is coming, and we'll work on that, and we'll double that and how that moves. But what does the 10-year strategic plan look like? What does my operation look like in 10 years' time? And hence, what are platforms that I need to develop now to make that work? So I'm going to take an example of what we've done in mining and, and show you how we then applied that in agriculture. Uh, what you see here is on the, on the y-axis is measurements of uncertainty, and along the x-axis is time. And this isn't a mining example where the, the light blue line that you see up the top is how much information do I know about my ore body, the ore that looks, you know, that's under the ground. How much information do I know about that ore? Because the more information I know about that, the greater, the more efficiency I'm going to get out of my operation. So what you get is this uh, uh, light uh, blue, uh, sorry, the light blue line that you see up the top here. And each little event that happens, you kind of get more information. And then, for example, here you might be blasting, and so you lose some information. Then you get some more information, etc. As you're going through. And the reason why this is important is when they went through the process of then trying to figure out, well, if I could get autonomous systems out there that were gathering information and doing things, how does that change the information profile? And as the darker blue line then shows what happens when they started to think through their technology roadmap and say, well, if I introduce this and make autonomy here and so forth, then the knock-on effect around information is that it drops by a certain, sorry, it increases by a certain amount, hence the drop in that uncertainty line. An increase in information means an increase in, in decision making. And what that does then, sorry, a better improvement in decision making. So what that does then is it defines for them where they should be spending their money and the activity they should be doing around autonomous operations. And so the reason why I'm kind of pointing this out is this focus away from just the platform and starting to think about, in our case here, what do farms of the future end up looking like and what do autonomous operations look like there. So we applied this into the Apple industry as an example. Um, and we spoke to growers and we said, you know, so when you, look at, when you look at your operations and you start to feed from the beginning of the production season to the end of the production season, what type of activities do you do and, and what happens there? And you kind of go through a decision flow diagram, as you can see there, and for one particular grower. Um, and then you start to understand, okay, so when I look at each one of these modules, I'm, you ask the grower two questions. How much information do you know about that particular process that you're going through there? And what impact does that have on the decision making that you have? And so if you start to define that, um, what you start to see is uh, this process where you can kind of go through the season, right, around in a, in a circle there. And for each one of those little activities, you start to define all the different sub-actions that they would go through. And 
whatever you see, what, at the end of each one of those sentences, you kind of see two variables, two letters, an L and an M and a H, right? So the L is telling you low, medium, and high. And what you'll see, for example, if I look at this thing here over here, it says that I, it's got high amount of information and it has a high impact on my decision making. And so what I've done is I've, I've put in bold all those areas where there's low amount of information, but it has a high impact on decision making. Now for a roboticist, that makes perfect sense to kind of throw in robotics and automation and sensing in that space. Because if you can start to improve the level of information for the farmer at that particular point in time, which has high impact on the decision making, then you can start to see robotics start to feed into the, into the paddock. In this particular case, it was all about can I, you know, if I can get a good count of my flowers or get a good count of my yield, and if I can do something about it, such as targeted spraying, um, then that may improve my um, yield efficiency and quality. So this is an example of a, of a particular bot, solar electric, um, that's in uh, operation. Hopefully it starts to play. Yep, good. Um, little sensor pod on the side. As the robot goes up and down the rows, the sensor is detecting, in this particular case, individual apples and counting all the individual apples and getting a density measure of all the individual apples as you're going through. Um, and the little targeted spraying system then will come along and there's about 50 times per second. It's just targeting away and just spraying at the individual pieces, right? So again, just experimenting along with these things and, and giving it to the farmer and seeing what, what can happen there. We did the same thing with uh, leafy vegetables. Um, and again, going through the whole process of speaking to the farmer and understanding what, what happens there. In that particular case, it's all around crop intelligence is the big thing. So using machine learning techniques and sensors underneath the platform, we're detecting individual lettuce. We're determining the crop growth rate of the lettuce. So if we go week by week, we can actually start to understand what the growth rate of the, of the lettuce is. Um, and we can look at yield estimation uh, as well, uh, which is what you're seeing there. If we're targeting individual lettuce, we know where the weeds are. We've got a little mechanical tie in there that can start to scratch away at the individual weeds um, as, it's going, as it's going through. And they, we're starting to look at reducing chemical use um, as the bot's going up and down the rows. And also, if you can detect individual plants and you start to know the crop growth rate, then you can start to target how much fertilizer to spray in this particular case, if you wanted to add fertilizer or some sort of chemical onto each individual plant. So a lot of this is real time. The robot's moving up and down, and it's sampling individual plants, looking where the weeds are. You'll see next it's actually doing some um, uh, water measurement right near, the, right near the plant. So in, in many respects, you've got this 24-7 bot collecting information. When we went through the information process pipeline for a vegetable grower, in this particular case lettuce, what we find is that if we can determine the first few, six weeks of crop growth rate and we can manage that uh, um, perfectly down to each individual plant, then what we can do is reduce crop variability later down. And reducing crop variability, maximizing yield for the grower at the end of the day. So this is part of taking an information flow approach to what happens in an operation and starting to feed that into the auto autonomous operations. The same thing with, uh, we just started this in the grazing livestock and trying to determine, again, talking to farmers and understanding their information uh, flow. Uh, in this particular case, it was about whether you could measure pasture quality around the paddock and whether you could then move animals to where the best pasture was. So there's a number of things here, being able to train animals to understand where the bot was and that bot was friendly and wherever the bot moved was gonna be good food, but also measuring pasture biomass as well as pasture quality. Pasture quality is very hard and we're still going through those steps. Um, as, you're, as you're moving the animals around, you're also detecting the animals themselves and you're building up gait information, so how the animals are walking. And if you start to build up a track history of each individual animal, uh, what you can start to do is determine whether or not the animal's healthy, all right, just both through its walking motion. So now you've got pasture quality and moving animals to the right pasture as well as measuring pasture, uh, measuring animal health as well, or starting to measure animal health. It's a long way away from there. The other thing, big thing for grazing livestock is, is weeds as well. So this is the robot autonomously going through a paddock, detecting serrated tussock in real time, and then positioning itself around the serrated tussock and just spraying the right amount of chemicals, herbicide that we need on that on the, on the tussock itself. So here it's just positioning itself, and it will now it, you know you'll see it in the next stage start spraying. So again, looking at the information flow for what a grazing livestock manager wants, can we measure pasture? Can we measure animal health? as well, or can we understand something about animal health? Can we move animals to the right part of the pasture for best yield? And can we get rid of the weeds? Um, and from that context, then being able to improve the quality. So that, that kind of tells you, so that's one aspect of, of the whole robotics program is about looking at understanding operations, understanding information decision flows through those operations, and then working out what is the right tools 
sensors, machine learning techniques, robotic systems that you can put in there uh, for that. The next, the next bit I want to talk about is some of the, the smaller bots that we're working with. The whole idea is, you know, how can we use a lot more of the fact that battery technology is getting better, solar technology is getting better, can we start to build smaller and smaller bots that might be also lower cost and a little bit more responsive um, in what we're doing. And this might be good for crop intelligence tools, for example, or, or pest detection tools. This is one of the first systems that we built being able to pick something to get all the smarts are in the wheels here. There's some, there's some uh, sensing uh, system that's just right there in the middle that's looking down the bottom. It almost, almost works like an inverse pendulum um, in this particular case, but you can dismantle it, put it in the back of a vehicle, go to another part and go from there. So it's almost like a drone on wheels. Uh, the difference being that we can operate this for about eight hours. It just runs up and down the rows um, as it's going through. And it's just collecting sensory information and getting some high accuracy uh, results uh, from there. Then being, building it as a modular unit as well, so that what you've got here is you've got a little smartphone on the front up the top there, so we're putting all the algorithms on the smartphone, making it low cost. Again, detecting individual plants as we're going up and down the rows, uh, doing targeted spraying, and also targeted seeding as well. So it's, it's really looking at how can we bring the cost of the bots down as well as the, the, the weight, um, as well as making them more, a lot more responsive. Uh, we tried this out on the tree crop industry, so what we saw before was the row crops, and now we're looking also at tree crops. Um, and just trying to, again, the, the whole purpose here is that if you can build these modular bots and bring them out across different commodities, then what you're doing is you're dropping the cost of the bots, right? You're just spreading out and you're amortizing the cost across different industries. In this particular case, we were looking at um, spraying. Um, this is just water at the moment now. We're just trying to test out different techniques. But what it's doing is it's detecting the density level of the fruit. So in this, I think this was a nectarine orchard. Just looking at the different density of the fruit. So you'll see it coming up soon now on the bottom there. It's detecting the individual fruit and then being able to spray the tree accordingly from there. So it's got independent nozzles and it's just uh, moving that around. Uh, but, so we use that both in this, this bot here. But that one there was the digital farmhand. So that was the, um, sorry, I'll just go back to it again. That bot there was the digital farming, so I was just trying to build this adaptable, um, um, uh, usable system across different industries. So, so that's that's about the small and responsive platforms. So that gives you an indication of where we're going with that. So again, information and decision flow. How does autonomy fit in that? How can we reduce the cost? How can we make the platforms modular? How can we make them go across commodities? Um, and recently, we got this project from GRDC, which was looking at uh, non-chemical weeding, and again, using the same the technology um, of the digital farming that I showed you before, and what kind of tools, sensors can we use underneath it. The first part of this, this is work that we did with um, Sergio Laval and Chris Betters at Physics, um, as well as Michael Walsh and Guy Coleman over in Agriculture. So it's a team effort looking at both different types of weeds, the robotic solutions, and the types of technologies that we can look at um, and we did a, firstly, we did an analysis of different non-chemical uh, weed um, tools and the energy requirements behind those. Again, if we're going small and responsive, we're using battery technologies and energy use is an important issue. So what are the right tools to use? And after looking through the different ranges, we're trying to look at both novelty, but also being able to detect weeds at different growth stages and also weeds between plants as well, between crops as well, and being able to target them accurately without damaging the, the plants. So trying to couple all those things together, we, we focused on laser weeding and we thought, you know, that would be something if we could solve it, then it would be a you know, bit of a game changer. So we started to tackle that. We're, we're still a while away from actually solving all the bits and pieces, but that was what we, uh, we looked at. And that's why we're working with the physics group who are building the laser units. So the, the picture on the right there is the digital farm hand, that robot that I showed you before, and you can see this little module underneath it, this little uh, grey module uh, sitting right there, which is this thing here, so what we built here. Inside that module is a sensing system which looks down at the crops, as well as um, we're piecing the laser unit and putting the laser unit underneath there. And it's positioned in such a way so that it, you can go through the different stages of the plant growth, so this, in this case here being uh, wheat, going through the different stages of plant growth and just being able to push the canopy away as the robot goes through so you can detect what's underneath the canopy. So it's looking at it from um, all the different um, growth rates. So we, some preliminary analysis. So on the left, the, the first most left of the image is the sensing system is looking down at the plants. And on the right there, wherever you see green, it's actually the weed being detected and the red is the, the wheat crop. So it's being able to segment out the different weed from the plant. So we're doing green on green and being able, or green on brown and being able to separate all that uh, different information. So we're getting, and this is results from about two months ago, just last week we got some much better results out of the process where it's able to 
very accurately distinguish the weed and its structure as well, which is important, because when we want to do something like laser weeding, we want to determine whether we're firing at the leaf or straight into the middle of the, the plant, you know, and, and start to understand the differences between there. This was, a, this was some initial tests, so you'll see here just the, the, the laser firing away at the, at the, at the weed, All right? So run that one again, if it runs again. Okay, and we're looking at different intensities, also at different frequencies of the laser, and, and where you're gonna fire away. You're gonna fire away at the middle or at the edges as well, and just trying to look at different uh, solutions from there. So just some, some results that we've gotten over the last month. Uh, what you're seeing here is turnip weed and ryegrass, and you know, the, down the bottom here is the different diameters of weeds, uh, sorry, of the laser pointer that we use, so different strengths. It's 423 nanometer laser unit. Um, it's about 10 watts, so it's not really a lot of energy, uh, but, it, but it also, at 10 watts, doesn't give us a lot. We've got to you know, devote it a, long, a longer period of time. So for emergence weeds, you can see here, so what we've done is we've, this is the control, so the yellow is the control here. We've just measured the biomass. And, and what you'll see here is, for example, when we fire away, it was eight seconds at the, at the weed that we don't get any regrowth of the turnip weed. Um, the ryegrass almost, almost dies at eight seconds on a 10 watt uh, laser unit. Over here, what we've done is, uh, so that was at emergence, and here it's um, at looking at, um, at early tilling in an eight leaf turnip weed. And this was again using eight seconds, 10 watt. And you can see here that we don't get a lot of control, right, so the yellow being a control again, and the other, the other colours there representing what the, what the different uh, weeds are, the different um, agents that we try to control. And you don't see a lot of improvement at the eight seconds, uh, but then here what you see is what we've done, we've got two minutes at 10 watts, um, so you'll see here, two minutes at 10 watts, we've completely killed the, the ryegrass compared to the control, and the tournament we'd here, we've killed it, but after about a, a week or so, a couple of weeks, it's, it's kind of, there's a regrowth period as well. So we've got to look at different size, laser units as well as different intensities. We're, we're going to go for the, the big model, the one that we can actually afford, which is a 100 watt laser and just see what happens there and, you know, and not cause a fire or anything like that. But we're just going to give that one a go at the next, at the next trials that we've got. But the early indications are that we've got some, you know, potentially an ability to be able to both detect the weed, understand the structure of the weed, and through some trials understand where to fire a laser and what strength and, and what frequency that laser needs to be to kind of kill that weed. And again, if you couple that with the small responsive units that can just go out there 24 seven and just move around, then you've got an ability to be able to detect the weeds and, and remove the weeds, hopefully. So the last, the last slide that I wanna talk about is just the, the aspects around some of the technologies that's feeding into robotics and, and what we're seeing there. Um, when you look at robotics, some of the things that people are talking about in terms of you know, what it can be used, whether it's autonomous platforms, being able to put intelligent implements, et cetera. So these are all the use cases for where robotics can come in. And, and that, that's gonna you know, dictate about a lot about how robotics will work. But I think the, the other more important thing is to actually see what some of the other technologies that are coming through. And I'll, I'll talk about some of them that I think are important in the grains industry because I think it'll, it'll matter a lot. But um, one of them is, is this is, is lab on a chip, which I think is, is gonna be a bit transformational. Uh, a lot of the guys in physics and our chemical faculty, uh, chemistry faculties now are, are working on being able to take, build microfluidic devices that can work on a chip. So basically instead of sampling the soil or sampling a piece of leaf or whatever it might be and then taking that into a lab and then waiting a couple of weeks is being able to get to the point where we can actually do the sample in the field um, and in real time and that's going to transform the industry a little bit if we can if we can if that ends up working again if you can imagine having that land model chip on a on a handheld device let alone on a robotic system which can actually sample and make a decision as well so that's that's one area another area is this unsupervised learning uh, so a lot of machine learning techniques now, or artificial intelligence, is really collecting lots and lots of data, then giving it to somebody who's then going to come along, trawl through that data, then detect what they're interested in and train a machine learning algorithm, which then sits on the robot, and the robot then has a model of what it's looking for. Uh, with unsupervised learning, there's the capability of the algorithms themselves to bypass that whole human intervention approach by throwing lots and lots of data and just having a supervisor that says, yeah, I like that, no, I don't like that, the algorithm can come along and retrain itself and just look at the data and just start to train on the data itself and build up models that it learns. And that's gonna, I think, gonna change um, a little bit of the, the industry as well. I think the energy system element, we're capitalizing on the fact that battery technology is getting a lot better and the industry is not moving away from that space. And I think that's gonna change both for small and large uh, vehicles that you might find on your on your um, on your farm in terms of uh, where that's going, and I think that's going to have an impact, especially on what tools we're going to use. 
uh, we're trying to drive in our lab a lot more around the non-chemical weeding elements as, and non-chemical in general as well um, in, across different aspects. And so energy is going to have a big implication um, on that process. Um, and I think the, the final thing here is probably soft robotics. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out where it is in grains, but in, in the other industries, we're seeing a big, big area around that. And that's being able to build robotic arms that have the same dexterity and agility as what a human arm has. Um, and we're seeing that working really well. And you can imagine that in harvesting and in pruning applications and so forth. And maybe there's an opportunity in grades there as well, but I'm not, I'm not too sure. So that's it. So thank you for your time. And I don't know if there's do we have questions. Yeah, questions at all? Thank you. So the papers are